I'd recently moved to Tasmania to work at the Environmental Defender's Office. He'd recently completed his legal prac course and was working at the Tenants' Union. We were at a fancy bar association conference at the poshest venue in St Helens. Little joke for the locals. <laughs> we were surrounded by barristers and judges and I was feeling young and scruffy and out of place. Then in walked Sandy in black jeans and one of those t-shirts with the tuxedo printed on the front. And I knew that I'd found an ally because he took the law and what you could do with it very seriously, but he never took himself seriously. We went on to work together at community legal centres for the next six years. During that time, he fought so hard for his clients, for better laws, for fairer fights, and to have human rights, uh, housing recognised as a human right. You would hardly know that he had cancer throughout all of that, except when you did. <clears throat> In 2010, things went downhill and it became harder and harder for him to work. He and Mezzi travelled while they could, they bought a home and they decided to get married. The only photos that I will show you tonight are from their incredible wedding day. I was a bit disappointed that the tuxedo t-shirt didn't get a second run. But <laughs> there he was, a rather concerning shade of liver failure yellow, but radiant with love. That a day so close to the end of his life could be so full of joy is Sandy and Mezzi to a T. Still wanting to drink in every last bit of everything. His eulogy, which was delivered a little over a week after this wedding, talked about how living with cancer had meant that Sandy lived with a special intensity. COVID has taught us that we should all do that. So is the climate crisis. So let Sandy's legacy be that we all live with purpose and intensity and joy. The thing about a life cut short is the potential that just sort of hangs there. The idea of all that he could have done if life, or in Sandy's case, death, hadn't gotten in the way. So that was the seed of the idea for the Sandy Junk Duncanson Social Justice Fund, a commitment from his family and friends to dedicate a lecture each year to discussing things that matter, to give small social justice projects a boost, to allow ideas to flourish, and to, for passions to be supported. I'd like to shout out to Natasha Cheecher and Rick Snell for championing the fund within the university right from the outset, to Owen Breen for his support, to UTAS for its continuing support, and to all the wonderful donors who have allowed this bursary to grow. Your generosity has allowed us to support an amazing array of young people to do amazing things for a decade now. I acknowledge um, past bursars who are in the audience here and those who are watching online. Sandy would be a bit embarrassed about all the attention, but it'd also be a bit chuffed, possibly even a bit smug. But, <laughs> And while this fund bears Sandy's name, it's really a love letter to all those working tirelessly in NGOs on the smell of an oily rag, those volunteering their spare time to further a cause, those dedicating their lives to something bigger than themselves in whatever form that takes. I want to thank all of Sandy's colleagues in the community legal and housing sector for the work you do to continue his work. And I particularly want to acknowledge the loss of two of those champions, Phil Hoffman and Meredith Barton. Of course, Sandy's most miraculous legacies are his two delightful and inquisitive daughters, Iris and Luca. There's someone up the back there. I hope that these lectures, these annual reminders of how much people loved your dad, serve to inspire your curiosity about all the possibilities. I hope it reminds you that despite appearances, this world is full of good people doing good things. And on that note, without further ado, let me introduce you to this year's recipients of the Sandy Duncanson Social Justice Bursary, Kelly Hammond and Dominic Burgess, and welcome them up to tell you about their project. Hi, everyone. I think that works. Um, yeah, so we're the grateful recipients of this year's bursary. Uh, the idea uh, came really from thinking a lot about the tipping point between uh, non-action and action and how many people, including myself and Dom, um, are at a point where you care so much and we're aware of so much, um, but for various reasons, um, 
we're unable to take that next step to physically show up in various ways. Um, so it's really started about wanting to unpack that for ourselves, um, but realising that we're not alone on that journey, wanting to um, put that into a resource for other people that might help them also take those next steps um, in their own lives. So, yeah, there's definitely um, various elements to the journal. Um, there'll be some educational sort of things, maybe a bit of around um, more the psychology of what stops us. Um, but then this, the main part really is personal stories. Um, so meeting with a lot of people that have taken that step and also highlighting that there's not just one avenue to being an activist. I think we also can have a pretty limited or specific idea of what that means, chaining yourself to something and um, doing reckless, crazy things. But no, there's lots of different ways to um, make changes. So it's about um, creating a resource that will help people on that journey and maybe relate to one of those stories or something that will help them to, to know what they want to do next or how they can do it. Um, yeah, so I guess for me, it's been pretty awesome going through the process of um, connecting with people and getting their stories um, while working on the project because it's, I guess I've tried to be really involved and in, as engaged with a lot of issues as I can over the past couple of years particularly. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's really hard and burnout is a huge thing and even like for a lot of people it's just hard to even conceptualise engaging with a lot of issues um, because life's pretty hectic for everyone. Um, so I felt really amazed by, through having these conversations with everyday people um, and really amazing people, but they are just people who have families and jobs and work, but are somehow able to implement amazing change and activism in their lives and just sort of through having those conversations with them I was walking away and feeling so motivated and just engaged and really optimistic about everyone's ability to make real change um, so that sort of really um, consolidated the idea of a personal story and its power to sort of inspire and yeah, I guess the idea is obviously it's not the same as having a conversation with someone yourself, but through recording those conversations and having them accessible to numerous people, hopefully a bit of that inspiration can sort of filter through and yeah, it can sort of serve as an initial starting point for people to connect and to engage with their community and start um, yeah, making real change in the world. Yeah, so I think um, I'll just touch on one person we've spoke to, uh, Todd Dudley. He's president of a Northeast Bioregional Network group, and he's a great example. Um, you know, he's working in a local sense in his area. He's very connected to that place. He has a history of working restoration work and conservation work there. So um, I think he's, through his journey, he's also understood the effectiveness of working with environmental law and changing legislation and, and actually stopping things before they start in that sense and tackling um, councils and things. So I think um, that not only is that important, but I think one thing we also want to make sure we share with everyone or um, portray is that every role is important and tackling everything from, from so many different angles. No one's more important, no... Um, yeah, no person or no part of the picture is more important. So we need people that are going to be on the front lines, but we need people who are, you know, generating awareness, doing rallies, doing legislative things. Yeah, and I guess that's sort of the idea is the journal can sort of exist as a thing, but sort of act as a tool to sort of um, kind of foster a much needed culture around activism and so people can sort of normalise having it as a part of like, yeah, you study, you work, you have your family life. But I think at this point in history, it's really important for people to, if they're able, and a lot of us are, 
to have that as an integral part of their life um, and do everything we can because we are at a point in history where there's not a lot of time as far as environmental collapse, climate. There's just so much going on at the moment. We all have to sort of engage in different ways that we can. Um, yeah, so this is um, just going to be an initial issue focused on that idea. Um, we're hoping in the future to do consecutive issues focused on more specific topics and things going on around the state. Um, and yeah, yeah, hopefully not just have it as a physical document or an online document or some resource, but create a bit of a culture in arts and music and events where people can sort of engage and create communities and connect with each other um, yeah, into the future. So that's, yeah. That's about it. Yeah, there's no there's no planned launch date yet for this issue, but that will be announced when when we know. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly and Dom, and sign up to our mailing list for details of when the launch is. Um, uh, part of the attraction for the committee uh, for this project was an idea around all of the different journeys to activism and through activism, and the idea that it was definitely a book that uh, Sandy would have on a coffee table and probably have marked up and written things in the margins. So thank you very much, Kelly and Dom, for the, pro the work that you've done so far, and we look forward to seeing that. And now on to the main event. In September 2020, eight teenagers and a nun applied for an injunction to stop the Minister for Environment from approving an expansion of the Vickery coal mine. That project was expected to release 100 million tonnes of carbon emissions across its life. Their case argued, for the first time, that the Minister for Environment owes a duty of care to future generations to protect them from the harms of climate change, and that allowing the Vickery expansion would be contrary to that duty. So tonight, we're here to hear about what happened next. To guide us through that conversation, can you please welcome the irrepressible, sort of Tasmanian cartoonist for The Guardian Australia, uh, and author of Carbon Neutral, Adventures of the Indefatigable Enviro Teens, uh, First Dog on the Moon. And joining First Dog Live from the mainland, we're delighted to have David Barnden and Varsha Yajman from Equity Generation Lawyers, who are the legal ninjas finding new and interesting ways to force decision makers to take account of the climate crisis, and four of the amazing students who are part of this groundbreaking action. The lead applicant, Anjali Sharma, Thomas Webster, Luca Saunders, and Bella Burgermeister. There'll be time at the end for questions. So again, those online, if you want to type your questions into the Q&A box, we'll get to some of those at the end. But for now, I'll hand over to First Dog. Hello. Can you hear me out there, wherever you are? I didn't realise you were all so enormous. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fantastic. No wonder the Environment Minister caved. Um, <laughs> now, I, I, I put you in a cartoon, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons I was asked to do this. Um, and, and Jess, for me, as a, a bitter old person, I think the, the, the best bit about it was the comedic potential, eight teenagers and a nun. It sounds <laughs> like this, well, like a, a ragtag crew of, of hapless teens, climate nerds, I don't know, I'm, I, um, a, a, and a nun and a, and a grumpy old washed up lawyer with a heart of gold and he's given, he's given up on everything, on making a difference and he's got one last chance. <laughs> and I know that's not completely accurate, David, but I think you might be played by Chris Hemsworth, possibly. <laughs> Although he, he, he could play Sister Bridget as well. Um, no, it's, such a, it's such a great story. Uh, we're, so, we're all so desperate for, for any, any good news. Um, and you, you crushed the environment minister like an endangered frog. Uh, <laughs> And I think if any member of the government was capable of feeling shame, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she would have. So, 
So, so really, it's uh, it's a it's a big congratulations. I think the the room is full here, and I'm assuming there are thousands of people watching because we're also we're also delighted. Um, and I, I'm assuming I'm assuming you were delighted. Um, I'll start with you, Bella, because I know Bella helped me with with my book, The Environments. Thank you. I think it turned out all right. Um, were you surprised, Bella, to find out that the Environment Minister didn't already owe a duty of care to protect future generations? I mean, definitely. I guess it was a bit of a shock to see that she didn't actually have any duty to any of us. As young people, you know, um, as we can't vote, um, she had no duty to take care of us. I just thought that was crazy. So. Okay. And, um, well, I'll ask David after... Uh, later about the, the process of, of getting you all involved. But Ange, you're, you've got to have your name on it. Is that, um, has that been an added pressure? Are the others jealous? Are they, do you get, you know, does, uh, <clears throat> oh, you probably get more, more pictures of yourself in, in, in the newspaper. Does any of that make, make any difference to you? Um, it, it, it means a lot to me. I'm obviously not the best person to answer whether the others are jealous. You can chuck that to Tom and Bella um, a bit later. I sure hope not because I try and like tell my lawyers and my um, all the media people to give them as many opportunities as they give me. But um, just to like take this kind of off the route, I am really, really grateful as um, a person of colour to be the lead applicant um, in this case because all of the media attention that I have got, um, I really tried to use it to tell the story of my family in India who are on the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, in fact, just today it was announced that um, Delhi, which is where I was born, is going into lockdown because of pollution instead of COVID-19. Um, so it really means a lot to me to be able to, I guess, spotlight the people who are on the front lines. And um, yeah, I just hope that Tom and Bella aren't jealous. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Um, are we, do we have Thomas and Luca? We do. Good day. Can't see them. Oh, hi. Uh, oh, there you are. Oh, I see four at a time. Okay. Um, so, Thomas, when you found out you won, what was your reaction to that? And then also when the minister went and approved the Vickery expansion anyway, how, how, how it's, a, it's a bit of a roller coaster. Well, we, I guess me, me and, and the rest of the applicants and, and the lawyers, we're all ecstatic that we won this landmark case, the first in, in any common law country to find a due to care, which you'd assume would already exist, um, but doesn't. Um, and then and then the, the day after, it's, you know, we, we were all disappointed, but we all kind of knew that this, that, that the line the minister was taking and the line the current government taking a run climb action that that she'll do anything to fight this um, and so we we're all, all very disappointed um, that, she, that she wouldn't accept the court's ruling um, but of course we were very very excited that the court had found that and we hope that's upheld in the appeal okay okay um, one of the questions and I'll go back to you again Thomas was about your with this experience your plan to to tackle climate change, but I realise this is this is probably it and the beginning of it. Um, obviously, well, the, the court case is the beginning of it. Um, are you all going to? I'm assuming you're all going to continue as as climate activists. Are you going to go into the politics, into law, live in a tree? Um, in an area that's going to be logged, have you have you given thought to all that sort of you know? Well, it's not what the next thirty years looks like, but um, the next five. Yes, um, Thomas. What about you? Well, I mean, I I, I see politics and laws having a very strong influence around being able to change um, uh, change the, the current status quo. But I see it as that's something that we should have to do, at least around action on climate change. That, that's something that's common sense. The climate is clear. We shouldn't have to be waiting until we go, get into university, get, get a degree or two degrees, and then get into politics or get, get, get into the law to be able to change these things. These things should already well be changed. They should be changed now, but they should well be changed by the time we finish school and finish university. Okay. Um, and Luca, is Luca... Do we have to? We don't have Luca. Okay. 
Bella, um, we know things that we know things are generally especially tough for young people. Um, well, everyone really, but and I, I I wondered about this question, but I sort of don't want to beat around it either. In terms of um, people's mental well-being um, and the struggle you have, the struggles you may have, um, do you? How do you look after yourselves? Um, I'm assuming there's some camaraderie in the group. Um, do you you find support for for those kind of, for the the difficulties you may feel you face? That's a terrible question. <laughs> That's all right. How, how are you doing? Are you okay? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm doing all right. Yeah, I know a lot of other young people are obviously struggling really diff, um, with climate change at the climate depression and climate anxiety um, are the huge numbers in young people now, um, especially because we're so well connected and we just know so much now. Um, and we're seeing the lack of action happening, especially by our politicians who um, are now just, there's just denial and, and it's just um, ridiculous to see really. And the amount of young people that are seeing that and just completely going down that, that, that road of depression or anxiety about thinking about what's happening to our futures and, and all that. And, and knowing that um, while we can do something, there's not we can't change everything right now, um, obviously. And I guess uh, I think especially in the groups that we're all in, um, the best way to do that is to support each other, um, to check in on each other is what we do all the time, um, especially I know in my local community and in the groups that I'm a part of, we always check in and make sure everyone's doing OK and, and have those discussions if needed, especially the difficult ones. Those are the ones you need to have. Um, and talking about the subject, as you said, it's a bit difficult to talk about mental health and everything, but having these discussions is the best way we're going to get around it and to, and to be able to support people, really. Yeah, OK, Ange, you were nodding at that. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, 100 percent. It's always it's always better, especially, um, you know, around times like this where we are coming up to what's probably going to be a really tragic bushfire season for a lot of frontline communities. Um, it's always better to check in on people, make sure people are doing okay, not just with, like their physical safety in bushfire seasons, but just with um, the mental toll that it takes on us, um, especially as young people, you know, um, knowing that we are going to have to keep going through this pattern for so many years to come um, and having to deal with the mental stress of living through bushfire seasons, through natural disasters, through floods, through worsening um, air quality, as well as, you know, everything else that life puts on us, as well as just being a teenager, as well as just going through school. Sometimes it can just feel like the whole world is against us. And I feel like having these conversations with people who are going through the same thing and also dealing with all these big feelings is a great way to um i guess just bounce ideas off each other bounce coping projects off each other and work through it together because um you know we are all in it together so yeah okay thank you have you thought about um getting arrested locking yourself to a train line at a coal uh refinery is that, do you think about that sort of stuff? Listen, everyone, everyone has their strengths. That's personally not what um, i It's not mine either. I, um, I kind of prefer the suing the government avenue. <laughs> it turns out that that's what I'm good at, so I'm going to be I don't know, that's, well, that's, that's a good answer. I think you've you know, answered the question twice there. Um, no, you, you're all terrifyingly articulate, and that's not, that's not me being patronising. I'm quite non terrified. Um, <laughs> COP26, it was a bit rubbish. Um, Thomas, what, did you, did you, have you paid any attention? That's a trick question. What did you think came, uh, what do you think about the, the outcome? I think the outcome showed, in, in the first instance, that there is some in international political will to start taking climate climate action seriously. But we're not seeing that from our current government. We're seeing we're seeing them trying to use uh, use un, un, undiplomatic ways of, of negotiating to try to uh, ensure that they can keep their donors happy. Um, and the international community has shown us that we need strong action on climate change, um, and that we need it now. And there's no alternative to that. Okay, okay, that's um, David. 
can you um, can you walk us just very quickly about through the process of of how you identified the most young uh, articulate climate activists in the country and got them to come on board with this? I, I certainly wish I could take credit, but um, these fun young people stepped up and, and were willing to talk to us. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's certainly not us, and it's, it's all up to the students and, and their willingness to be involved. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and, and the nun, Sister Bridget? <laughs> yeah, I just gave her a call. Um, I was like, hi, Bridget, um, would you like to represent some younger people in a case about climate change? And she was like, yes, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's and fantastic. That's how it started. So how is the case actually progressing at the moment? The, as I understand it, Susan Lay is she's appealing the decision that she should have duty of care for the children of Australia, <laughs> which, I mean, I, I love this. This is great for me. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure about everybody else. Yeah, look, I think it's pretty obvious that most people wouldn't argue with a duty not to go around harming Australian children. <laughs> um, but uh, that's the position she's taken. Um, we've had the hearing of the appeal and now we're waiting uh, for judgment. We don't know when that will be, but possibly before Christmas. Oh, really? Maybe. Okay. Um, and so Whitehaven is currently has permission to expand. Um, it, and pardon my ignorance for not reading. Um, so the decision wasn't that Whitehaven shouldn't. It was that she has she does have a duty of care. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and, it, yeah. There's, there's a first issue. Of this. No, that, that was that was you. Um, anyway, so it's it's uh, we will try. Uh, we won't get into the the legal detail. <laughs> because I won't understand it. Bella, <laughs> the, um, so climate action, is it the fundamental social justice issue? Uh, there was a good article from hmm, Jeff Sparrow in The Guardian today. I mean, there's always good articles in The Guardian, but uh, um, and I think uh, he was just talking about the importance or the primacy of, of climate. Um, and it's, I suppose it's a, it's a difficult thing because you say, well, look, civilization in the world is ending. There's all these other incredible injustices in the world that, that we know about and that we're fighting for. Um, and I think, I think he was putting the boot into the culture war, which is probably, he was suggesting it was a distraction. What's your take on, on the whole schmozzle? Um, I think climate... Climate action is important, obviously, because without that, without a stable climate, all these other issues are going to get so much worse. Um, but I think what we need is climate justice, where which is where you fix the climate and our issues with that, but you also fix our other major problems um, and bring everyone up and try to bring everyone up to the same level while fixing this, because that's what we need. We're not going to be able to solve one problem without solving the other, because they're all interconnected um, in, in some way. Um, and we need to work together with all the different communities and all the different issues and problems that we have to solve them together because you'll find that once you start figuring out one, the others will just fall into place and we just need to start collectively working together because that's our major issue at the moment is we're all separately trying to work things out, but we need to just come together and, and talk about these things really. Oh, okay, so, so in terms of left-wing progressive movements around the world, the left is kind of... I mean, which you're on it, even if you you you, you don't want to be. Um, <laughs> the, the the left around the world is is certainly falling behind. If, if it was a race, um, the right would be winning. And I suppose, and how do you have a view on how we motivate the billions of people around the world who aren't wealthy to possibly I don't know, eat the ones who are or. <laughs> Or just get them out of the way, or it's. I mean, is that how do we how do we motivate? Have and, and careful how you answer this question because if you're right, we're onto something. Um, but how, how do we how do we do that? How do we actually get everyone on board to realise that 
in an enormous lump, we're all powerful. I feel like this could go down a really different path because in, you know, I take history and in history we've learned that like all the, all the revolutions start with a discussion like this where someone puts the question like how do we eat the rich and then we actually end up trying to eat the rich but it never works out for us. So um, I'm just going to say that I think that humanity the goal in general is pretty clear like everyone wants to survive to, I mean that's the best way I can put it and I think that even those on like the right wing um having economic considerations you can't completely discount that um you know you have to understand that many people have made a living have made a livelihood out of fossil had out of the fossil fuel industry um many people's lives are reliant on coal um and i think that um, considerations like that are valid i think that um doubts about just completely uprooting our lives and moving to renewable energy are completely valid and i think that um well, there needs to be a lot more clarity on what just um, net zero, what um, reducing emissions looks like. And I think that this is where the government needs to step up and take charge, needs to um, outline actual plans for a um, a just transition to a low carbon economy, not the, um, the, the Australian way booklet that we got, because I don't know if you guys saw the last few pages of that were blank. Um, it, <laughs> And I think that this is where the government really needs to step up and because we need to clear that what we do need is a low, carb low carbon economy and if they outline actual steps, actual incentives to get there, then we will get there without having to eat the rich at any point. Oh, well, I'm... Yes. That's fantastic. I, I I was looking forward to reading the rich, but I'm okay, okay with 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 not doing that. Do you all like hang out in Zoom meetings as a group on the weekend or something? Do you uh, do you have structured time or unstructured time together? Is it weird that you're kind of part of this, you know, um, superhero Enviro crew, but you're all in different cities and you have you ever all been in the same room at the same time? No, no. Well, isn't the world terrifying? We definitely do hang out on Zoom, though, and it, it, it gets quite fun, especially with the lawyers. Like, they, they look really professional, but don't be, don't be fooled by, like, the college shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David, so um, if, if the, so the case I've got here this has been described as stunning, novel and groundbreaking uh world leading um so that's that's kind of a big deal I and mean, it got a lot of press overseas you are you impressed with yourself because everyone else is uh, um no i mean what people need to understand is just a huge team effort so we have a big team of barristers all of the students are amazing um, we've got some excellent people dealing with with media. Um, Varsha um, on the screen has done so much work, um, including connecting us with the students and, and doing a lot of the legal work. So it's a huge thing. Okay, I'm sorry, I haven't asked Varsha a question because she disappeared off the screen. Um, but I will. You're taking, um, Varsha, um, a number of innovative approaches rather than the traditional route. I mean, this is, it's kind of, Wild West environmental—it's it's activism through through lawyering rather than lawyering that leads to activism, isn't it? I mean, is that uh, are, are lawyers allowed to do that? Oh, I don't know if it's activism. I think I feel like a duty of care should already be there, and the fact that it's not is something that we're just bringing up and and telling the courts that it should be there. So I wouldn't say it's activism. I think it's it's great to see activists taking part, but. I think it's just a really democratic process at the end. All right, so you 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 haven't clearly don't despair at the the venal nature of the justice system in this country, the the corruption at the highest levels of government. Nobody, repeat, I'm get, I don't want to get sued for defamation or anything, but <laughs> but you know it's pretty bad out there, and and the courts don't necessarily seem to work in, in, in favour of what normal 
people like we have here in this room or, or on, the, on this Zoom call would consider to be justice. I mean, that's... Yeah. That's, um, well, I think what, what Bella was saying before about climate justice, ultimately that's what we really want to get out of this case. So I think, you know, times are changing, hopefully, um, and putting out cases like this and seeing so many other countries do the same. I think it's the only way forward, if not just sitting back and saying that it's corrupt would, would probably get us nowhere. So yeah, I'm super grateful to, to see this case take off and like all the media and press and just awareness around it. Okay, well, I'm. It's it's different. Do you spend any time on Twitter? Because that's that's no fun at all. This is a lot of positivity and enthusiasm, and I, I, I there's a. Um, I suppose there was a there was a discussion recently, I think, around the nature of hope and how it was potentially um, problematic, um, but, and I'm 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 sensing a fair bit of it. Um, if not in the room, from from the work that that you mob are doing, do you feel hopeful? It's hard to not feel hopeful when you you know when you're on a panel like this, when um or when you're just on a Zoom meeting with a bunch of other people that you're suing the government with, or you know when you when you your stories about your case and you know you realize that. Um, while I'm here at home studying for my studying for my exams that I have tomorrow, um, I'm also in the middle of a um, court case that is taking the government to court. It seems that there is so much, I guess, power behind our case. There is so much momentum right now. Um, we're coming up to a federal election, and just before the election, um, Susan Lee is trying to appeal a case that says that she has a duty of care. So while she's trying to get elected, she's also trying to tell us that I'll get elected, I just won't care about the young children. You know, there's obviously, like, change is coming. There is a big shift coming, and it's hard to not feel hopeful um you know even though cop 26 was a load of like wasted time um the protests outside cop 26 the protests in australia for cop 26 were absolutely insane they were massive and you know you can't deny the amount of force that is behind our movement right now and i think we're about to reach that critical mass um that really i guess pushes our government into action well Personally, for me, thank you. I I'm a, a bitter and jaded old cartoonist, and I came in here tonight uh, thinking, well, I won't even go into it, but it's 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 not it's not easy being a cartoonist. Um, <laughs> but that's fantastic. That's I'm I I have hope again. This is like Christmas. Um, <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to thank you. I want to thank all of you. I, we probably should take some some questions now from the audience if they're if they've woken from from their hopeless slumbers like me. Oh. Thank you very much. We, we will move to Q and A. So there are some questions coming in. So I might ask one of the ones that's been asked online. And in the meantime, if anyone who wants to ask a question in person can put their hand up. We will need everyone to wait till they've got the microphone, just so that people um, listening online can hear. But um, maybe for David or, or Varsha, this, uh, one of the questions was, what does it actually mean if the appeal um, is unsuccessful? So if the duty of care exists, what does that mean for approval of future mines? Um, if the duty is unsuccessful, well, we'll just, I, I think we've got to vote people out. Um, but if we're successful with the duty, then we can, um, hopefully revisit the, the decisions that um, Susan Lee has made recently and um, attempt to ask the court to make a decision that she has breached her duty in improving the new minds. Right, we've got a question up there. Um, yeah, I'm astounded by how fabulous you all are. Thank you uh, for what you're doing. I'm really interested to know how you came together and um, how you knew to approach David, you know, as a as a public interest lawyer myself, getting a dream team of plaintiffs <laughs> is pretty amazing. So I'm really interested to know how you came together and uh, got got into this process with David. Um, 
so, oh, sorry, Ish. Um, so the way it kind of started was um, they essentially, like the lawyers, these amazing lawyers got in contact and were like, do you know any under 18 who want to be part of this really amazing case? And I think when I first heard about it, I didn't really believe it. I was like, oh, okay, you know, like, this sounds way too good to be true, taking the environment minister to court and all of that. And then I put a message in one of our like school strike for climate channels and immediately there was so many of these amazing strikers coming and saying yeah we want to be part of this and I was like okay this sounds amazing so it, it literally happened through probably like two text messages and yeah I think it's really just the, the motivation and the drive everyone has in the climate movement but also especially in this team so it's just amazing to see it all happen now. Right, um, just got a mic. We'll go to you next. We've got a mic up the back there. Oh, hi, it's Karen here, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I'd just like to ask because I'm a teacher of primary school children who are looking, you know, to the future, um, especially here in Hobart, where they don't, uh, some people on the outer suburbs struggle. Um, I just want to know how you all, you know, keep going what gives you hope and joy because that's what a lot of young people need i have to say it's it's stuff like this like i have i have an exam tomorrow um i had an exam yesterday and when i tell you i really 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 didn't want to be here i was so close to texting my lawyers and being like yeah i'm pulling out like i'm i'm sick i'm not coming um, I, um, I, I feel so busy right now, but coming here and, um, you know, being able to hear from Tom and Bella, which, you know, I do that constantly, um, but just, again, being able to um, hear the things that they have to say, being able to hear the things that um, David and Varsha have to say, um, you know, being able to hear the things that First Doug has to say. Do I call you Mr. First Doug? Um, <laughs> Um, being able to hear the things that Mr. First Dog has to say, um, it, it reminds me just about the need to keep going. It reminds me about um, the people that that activism is for. Um, and this goes right back to the start of the lecture when we heard about um, about Sandy and about that story. Again, it reminds you what you're doing activism for, and that's what drives us every day. Go back to the idea that, okay, you've got a, a victory. The victory establishes a duty of care. Forget about the appeal for the moment. Uh, I, much like one of the earlier questions, wonder what duty of care is going to amount to. I can imagine someone saying something like, look, Australia is such a piddling part of the problem and nothing much that we do is going to do anything without China and India coming on board. And we're much better, duty of care is much better enacted by um, mitigation exercises, not prevention exercises, assume that it's inevitable and set about uh, minimising harm. Would that constitute duty of care? Um, arguably so. Um, the, so the scientific evidence in this case was that this particular coal mine, 100 million tonnes worth of emissions, um, creates a real risk of pushing the world into certain tipping points and non-linear changes. So the judge accepted that and every single mine matters. And, and that's the state we're in. Um, sure, climate change is a complex problem but the courts understand that, the experts understand that, and hopefully the minister will understand that as well. And so I might just ask one question from online um, before we go to another audience question. Um, so we've had a question that uh, beyond fossil fuel extraction, what other areas would you like to see community legal action taken in relation to the climate? Um, maybe I'll pass it over to one of the students. What, well, what else would you like to? What else would you like to see? 
<laughs> Just our government, I think it's good enough. Really, it's like Christmas. Like, what? How long's the list meant to be? <laughs> how many seats are in Parliament? All right, we'll, we'll just assume that there's a, there's a whole shopping list that we can get to later. Um, down the front here. Yeah, hi. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say um, um, thanks for, your, for the uh, participants for not so much courage but commitment to, um, to follow it through and do what you've done. Um, it, I, I guess if everybody did this, um, perhaps the world would be a better place. But um, firstly, if I could just ask David and Varsha, I'm assuming this was a test case. So obviously the participants um, weren't liable for, for costs. But my real question um, is really um, similar to um, Mr. Dog. Um, I'm an old cynic. Um, and and I'm, I'm wondering whether um, at the risk of being um, uh, uh, castrated at, at the end, um, <laughs> I, I tend to think um, similar to uh, uh, all lives matters, um, uh, sorry, black lives matters, I think it really should be all lives matters. And similarly, in this particular case, I'm wondering whether it shouldn't be um, the future of the young being protected, but why aren't we asking, why are we all not being protected? Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, um, finally, at the end of that, um, because the, the court's assuming we don't lose the appeal, um, what does that really matter? Um, what does that really mean for Parliament, not so much for a court case, for the judge to say, yes, yes, you've won your appeal, or more appropriately, they've lost their appeal. Um, what's going to happen in terms of changes? Sure, the court case really is against the, um, the minister, but what we really want is a change in legislation so we're all protected now and into the future. Uh, there's a bit to unpack there. Um, but <laughs> um, Bridget, Sister Bridget, is bearing the costs. Um, she just, it, it is a, a case about a novel or a new duty, but um, she was prepared to, to bear the cost risk. So I, I think if there's any, any other adults out there who are, is interested in, in bearing cost risks on this sort of litigation, come and talk to us. Um, um, and, you know, one of the parts of the duty of care is that it's, um, it's owed to, to younger people who will suffer uh, the worst of the impacts from, from climate change. And, and so there's a, there's a really large element of, of vulnerability there. And in fact, the judge did describe what's happening now as possibly the greatest intergenerational injustice ever inflicted by one generation of humans. Um, and kind of just adding to that, I guess, like none of the cases or like this case especially isn't saying that, you know, a 90 year old's life is worth less than a young person's life, but it's more that the brunt of climate change is going to be more significant on people who are younger now. So even with Black Lives Matter, it's not just the lives of Black people that matter, but it's just that these people are on the front lines of you know systemic racism so in the same way young people are on the front line of climate change ultimately and obviously even in that you have more nuanced groups of like people of color and indigenous people but yeah that's the essence of of the case i guess in a way and ultimately if we achieve what we want with this case and we um you know evoke this type of legislation the type of um concrete plants and that's that we're looking for um everyone wins. it's not just the young people it's not just the people under 18 who benefit um it's everyone in society who will benefit from um having a safer future just like um with black lives matter again if we um reform the justice system the um police system like the um black lives matter looks to it's not just black people who matter who um benefit it's entire it's the entire society Excellent. Tom? Uh, thanks, all of you. Um, this is a question for Varsha or David. Uh, obviously, Australia has signed up to various international agreements with you know, promising uh, concepts like intergenerational equity. But could you explain for us what would be the significance of, of getting this acknowledged in the duty of care context and the sort of power of that, I guess, if it becomes part of the common law? in Australia and then potentially by extension other common law countries? Uh, um, I mean, this case ignores international law. Um, it's, it's the common law developing to protect vulnerable people and to confront 
problems that modern day society faces. So irrespective of what happens at international law and irrespective of whether sovereigns get their acts together to, um, to limit climate change appropriately, this, this is the way that the law is responding and we're very encouraged by it. Okay, I might actually, oh, we got one more. Oh, I, I wanted to thank you for your enthusiasm and um, once again and, and um, but I wanted to speak to more of a big picture viewpoint and um, having grown up in the 60s and 70s the the time of when um, young people really did start having a voice and and trying to make themselves heard and now moving to your time um, when you're obviously so eloquent and so committed and, and passionate about what you're saying how do you feel about the fact that voting age is 18 um, and that do you feel that um, that, that should be uh, readdressed and, and given giving you more of a voice and more of a chance to be able to um, have some effect on your future? Do you think that there's enough of a groundswell amongst your age group to, to take that on board and look towards doing something about that? I mean, I think, I, th I think they, you know, there've been places around the world which are starting to adopt um, for voting un under the age of six, um, voting between the age of 16, six, six and seventeen year olds, as well as uh, above eighteen. And I think what, what's really important with this, what, um, what, what, when I when I discuss the issue, is that 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 needs to be incorporated with very strong civics education within schools, um, and we see that being very varied from from school to school, and that it's crucial that we that we empower young people by giving them the knowledge. Of what politics looks like, giving them the tools how to change it, um, and then showing them the way that politics should be like and can be like. Because the way we see politics currently, it's not the way that politics should be. That's great. All right. Well, thank you. That's that's brought us right to time, and we're, uh, so this has been excellent. But what, what I thought I might do is just um, give each of you an opportunity. Um, to just share something that has surprised you about this whole process. Go, as you've gone through, has there been anything that's really surprised you about either the law as it was, the, the process and how it's affected you, or the outcomes? Um, I guess uh, I was definitely surprised by the fact that the minister thought she didn't have a duty of care and is fighting that. It's just absolutely crazy to me, and I guess a lot of un other young people and everyone here as well, um, it's just incredible to see that she thinks that she doesn't owe the children of Australia to just take care of us really and to not put our lives at risk in the future is insane for me and I know everyone else that's here and all the other litigants. Something that I've been really surprised about is um, kind of how relevant Australia's defamation laws become um, when you when you're in the spotlight like we are um with, you know making socials graphics talking to um the media we have a very strict guidelines of um you know what to completely avoid saying um just so we don't get sued for defamation um and that's something that's really scary and it's something that you know it can be a joke but then to us it suddenly has become very very real because none of us want to be sued for defamation um and i think that the fact that the laws are so strict um in this country is something that has really surprised me and it's actually very scary yes it is yes and i'm sure uh, having the guardian lawyers on um on on hand is, is useful for you sometimes too um thomas or Varsha? I think just the huge amount of support that 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 um, that, 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 that we get in in this case, um, it, it's it's amazing. We 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 have, we held we held a crowdfunder to raise funds for the appeals case, and we were absolutely blown away with um, with, with how generous everyone was. Um, and, and and it's just just incredible to see see so many people saying taking so so much of a close interest um, in in this case. So we we, we just say thank you um, to everyone. Yeah, massive thank you. And also something that really sprung for me was just seeing all the evidence accepted into a judgment. Um, I think there's just so much of controversy around like, oh, well, some of these scientists are wrong and they don't know what they're saying. But to see that put into writing by a system that we hold so high and at such a premium was just really amazing because I think it 
kind of shuts down those climate deniers almost that this is a real thing now it's just about establishing that duty and saying that the government does owe it that's that's excellent thank you look can i get everybody to join me in thanking all of our wonderful speakers tonight so It's been, I think, a really fascinating insight into how broken our legal and political systems can be. But as Leonard Cohen would say, the cracks are where the light comes in. So I'd just like to thank you all for all the work that you're doing to let the light in. Um, thank you, especially in a time when you're all doing exams for making the time to come and talk to us tonight. Um, it, for those who aren't already on our mailing list, if you, uh, there's some sign-up sheets going around and we'll keep you posted on the updates on the appeal, which may be before Christmas, but maybe not. Um, tonight's talk will also be available as a video and a podcast via the Island of Ideas website. I'll try and get them to edit out the bits of me weeping. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, I'd like to acknowledge my fellow committee members, Mezzy Wilson, Steph Carlin, Jane Hutchison, Sally Glatzer and Bev Jefferson, for an absolute joy to keep Sandy's Flame alive with. Thank you to UTAS, particularly to Belinda Brock and her team Eden, Sarah and Milan for their help in getting tonight to run so smoothly. Thank you to Glatzer Dixon Wines and the Tenants Union for supporting this event. And finally, a reminder, as Thomas has just said, that social justice does not come cheap. So there's information about how to support the Sharma appeal on the slides, um, so you can chip in and help the students with that fund. And the Sandy Duncanson Social Justice Fund is also, um, also takes donations so that we can keep supporting projects like the wonderful projects that um, Kelly and Dom talked about tonight. And First Dog's book is available at all good bookstores and probably some terrible ones too. So <laughs> thank you all again for coming tonight. Thank you for engaging in the discussion. Thank you to all of the students and to, to David and Varshna for all that you're doing and looking for interesting ways and innovative ways to get people to not only care but be forced into action. Uh, so thank you all and good night. <laughs>